Okay. Uh, thank you, Victoria, for the introduction. Uh, and thank you all for also being here in the second day of the symposium. It's actually good to be also on the side of the speaker after, uh, let's say, all this our effort to organize the event. So I'm happy to present today something that is only just a part of my research in general to the history of uh, the student housing uh, as a topic, as a specific topic. But at the same time, what I'm doing is also an attempt to kind of uh, do research also in the history of Western education in general. Um, and I think that, I, of course, I, I'm doing it in a kind of a very privileged position, considering that I consider both myself and also the environment when I work and I live as kind of the very the, the main protagonist of the subject of this research. Uh, and especially our, let's say, uh, own conditions or sub our subjective condition as uh, I usually use the term the students for life somehow, to a certain extent. So, uh, and this allows me to understand, to try to understand when the student emerged as a, as a figure. As I said, it's quite interesting to do this research within the environment of, uh, of the university with its own, uh, let's say, price of prejudice and allow somehow to create, a, let's say, to give, let's say, the field to, to start this research. So this presentation uh, is actually based on uh, a specific type, which is the type of the college. Uh, I would say that uh, in the history of university college as a type has uh, remained for a very long time, it's very persistent, let's say, uh, architecture uh, form uh, starting from the Middle Ages, uh, which is basically from the 13th century, more or less when the university movement started to, uh, when the university movement arose in Europe at the time, till the 14th century, then uh, there would be a very short parenthesis of what is called the Sapienza or the Student Palazzo during Italian Renaissance in the 15th century. And then after uh, an important contribution that was made by the Jesuit uh, order during the 16th and the 18th century with their colleges, somehow the Jesuits had to be understood also uh, as a counter-reformation order, but at the same time also as a critique to what the uh, Renaissance Palazzo was becoming, and as, as I will show in, in a minute. And then uh, finally, the, the, the Jeffersonian campus, uh, so basically the invention of the modern campus uh, and the work of Thomas Jefferson as a president, as also as an architect, and of course his contemporaries. Actually, the word college, uh, although we associate it to somehow to a specific type, to this, uh, let's say, uh, to the idea of the to formal structure of the cloister, of the courtyard, uh, I would say that uh, since, let's say, uh, coming from the, the word comes from the Latin, uh, refers to the Latin, let's say, legal word college, which means an association of people that are kind of gathered together according to common interest, basically. Etymologically, uh, it comes from the, uh, the word uh, cum, which means basically together, uh, and the words ledger, uh, which means to collect or even to select. So, uh, as I said, uh, although in the Middle Ages, this will come very close to a specific archetype, uh, the one of the cloister or the courtyard, which is basically, according, using the words of Carlos Martialis, the formal structure that keeps together uh, or a system of relationships between building. Uh, the idea of college uh, till, the, till the 16th century, uh, the world uh, still represented a very abstract entity to a certain extent, in the sense that it referred more to a set of uh, relationships, uh, to a system of organization rather than to an architectural artifact. But if you see in this image, uh, the one in the left by Raphael, uh, even in the representation of education in general was associated more to a set of relationships. So we see here uh, Plato, philosophers, and we see actually the School of Athens depicted in a, in a venue that could be rather basilica or uh, or church, or even a, a piazza in, in a square, or even a loggia. Uh, and also at the same time on the right, uh, in this very realistic representation of uh, in, in one of the first printed encyclopedia, in the frontispiece there is depicted this image, which although it's, it's very realistic, uh, 
uh, it tries to represent actually more the diagrammatical part of the organization of uh, uh, medieval college, particularly the fact that we have this structure from the, the trivium to the quadrivium, and finally the last subject, which is theology, and keeps everything that's say, and it's stuck, it's put on the top. So although it is represented as a tower, colleges at the time were not towers; they were organized, as I will show, as uh, courtyards. So this representation showed how actually what was more important in the use and the circulation of the word college was actually the uh, abstract form of organization of the university in general. Uh, the first, let's say, uh, model or the, uh, the first type, uh, to be more precise, is actually related to the medieval college. And at the, uh, at the same time, as also I'm trying to understand in my research, uh, of course, every condition or every type produce also specific subjectivity related to the students. So students, as, it, as also has been argued in this very interesting book by uh, of Philip Ayres, who argues actually in the history of childhood, childhood was never understood the same, let's say. Uh, for example, we consider mature life starting from 18 years old, but this, of course, has changed in the course of history, for example. And in fact, the first model uh, of the student, uh, I would say that was also considered as a monk. But this refers mainly to the fact that medieval colleges were particularly related to the archetype of monasticism and monasteries, which were monasteries which were very particular, very, very diffuse in Europe at the time. At the very beginning, when the two oldest universities were founded, Bologna and Paris, uh, the city didn't have a proper structure where to host students and lecturers. For lecturers, were still used places like uh, churches or monasteries, as you can see, for example, in this fragment of Ambrogio Slorizetti, the good and the bad government. While students, uh, for in terms of housing, had to find a place by themselves in the city. Let's say uh, going to college at the time was also they had to kind of find solution in rented housing from one of the townhouses of the city. Of course, uh, uh, in many cities, this with the increase of the number of the students started to be kind of unsustainable. Considering also the fact that, as I said, students at the time had to follow college in a very young a young age, so they had to enroll university starting from 12 or 15 years old, so uh, still kids somehow. And so this proved to be very unsustainable in terms of, let's say, controlling and controlling the discipline of the students. So for example, the city of Paris tried to concentrate all the university function in just one specific part of the city, which is, by the way, the actual quartier, uh, Latin quarter in, in Paris. As I said, this not only was unsustainable, but at the same time, in order to be productive or in order to be, let's say, related to the university, these had to be kind of regulated to a certain extent. And of course, here comes the invention of the courtyard and the cloister as, a, as it's an archetype to, uh, to be transferred from the monastic tradition to the one of colleges. So in this sense, uh, Oxford and, and later on Cambridge in time could be seen as a miniature version of what happened in Europe in general uh, during the university movement between the 12th and the 13th century. At Oxford, the first to provide such a structure, uh, a welfare structure, I would say, was uh, Walter de Merton, who was basically Lord Councillor of England at the time. And he decided to host uh, or to build a university or a college for a number of 30 or 40 students. And from that time, they, uh, this will be called quadrangles, uh, which besides the monastic influence, they remained for many times the result of a series of additions of buildings around the courtyard. The idea was that before every founding, there was first a benefactor who decided to provide this welfare for a limited number of, of students. Then this benefactor had to buy land within available, the available land, land that was at the time at Oxford, and then start to first to build the housing, not, all, not the housing structures, but the teaching structures like the church, and later on, uh, all the rest of the buildings. Um, while on the one hand, Merton on, on the left actually built the college, that, as you see also from its final form, it's kind of casual in the way buildings are composed in this practical composition around the courtyard. It will be only uh, in 1379 with new college, the example on the right, where well, basically its founder, William of Wykeham, uh, architect and builder, uh, that the college at the time was designed according to a unitary plan with all its typological buildings and facilities like the chapel, 
the the ma uh, which is uh, used for mass and pray the halls for the lecture and also dining room which is the same place when basically uh, the lectures were taking place and of course spaces for storages kitchens and finally the dwellings of the students from them we would say it is possible to say that the court had became a kind of successful type for a series of reasons first of all it allowed the structure of academic life uh, to follow the statutes, uh, every every college, like in a monastery, like in a monastery, has its own rules, uh, which were called the statutes. Uh, so this idea of the courtyard kind of allows, to a certain extent, to respect and also to follow what were the statutes, which regulated not only the academical, let's say, program of college, but also how collective life had had to take place within the building. <laughs> At the same time, uh, this structure uh, allowed also, as I said, following uh, or controlling discipline of, of these very young students uh, uh, in the sense that, especially in the city of Oxford, Bologna, as well as in Paris, uh, building college meant also having meant also a very radical or violent act to a certain extent because there was suddenly this body of foreign people coming in the in the city so this kind of generated a sort of uh, continuous conflict with the existing inhabitants for example in bologna and i should have said it at the beginning the two main paradigms or the archetypes let's say of uh, europe at the time the one of bologna and the one of paris they differed from the fact that the university of uh, bologna was basically a guild of students so students had the influence in decision making in selecting the professor and so on and they also had a certain later on in time they will have a certain influence also in decision making of the municipality which becomes kind of uh, very interesting although there is continuous conflicts with the city. So at Oxford, this was understood by using these very close archetypes. And in fact, uh, after a certain time, in order to avoid any kind of conflicts, let's say at night in bars and let's say places where also town people gather, they used to close these, basically the gates and uh, uh, on every gate, there was also a gatehouse that allowed the controller or the dean of the, of the college to control the entrance and the exit. Of course, the adherence of college with their own statutes uh, and the rules uh, and how this way was very close to the coeval monastic tradition was very visible in the architecture of the of the of the room of the chamber. College statutes uh, emphasize a lot collective life and this fact was uh, seen in the in the organization of the, of the room, which still remained a shared space. So in one room, you could find a minimum of three students to five students, depending on, let's say, on the grade, depending on the, on the year. And the only private space that would be allowed in these uh, rooms is actually only the studio, studiolo, which allowed to, to the student to have some time, some practice time for, for studying. And in fact, it's interesting, I didn't put an image of it, but sometimes uh, uh, Oxford and Cambridge, which are also known for inventing this tutorial system, the idea of having a tutor was a figure who would mediate, let's say, the role of the professor with the students. They kind of uh, emphasized a lot also the affinity between students and tutors. And there were also examples where students and tutors could live in the same place, sometimes also sharing the same bed, which is a very typical situation in the Middle Ages. Of course, I'm not suggesting this for today. The Sapienza and the Palazzo uh, in various sense Italy were uh, two words that used to identify a very specific, I would say, a variation of the type, uh, which referred to the college as it was intended in Italy at the time. Uh, this passage will signify a very important shift of paradigm in the sense that from this, uh, I forgot to say, but it's quite important that the previous colleges, the Middle Ages college, has also this religious character, but at the same time, a caritative mission. So the idea is to provide housing, first of all, to those students who couldn't afford not only housing, of course, but also for following lectures and so on. This, uh, there would be an interruption to this, let's say, mission, especially starting from Italian Renaissance for a series of different reasons. Uh, when basically, uh, as it is, I would just show how this passage was possible, or what happens uh, uh, to be more precise. In these very interesting images that is uh, bring by the book of Jacques Legault, The History of Intellectuals in the Middle Ages, you can see how actually this change is possible also in terms of dress and in terms of positions or maybe in terms of hierarchies and space, if you want. 
You can see here, for example, the fact that uh, the uh, master and students in the mid Middle Ages, they were really close in terms of dress, for example, in terms of status and class. And at the same time, there is not even a hierarchy between the classroom and uh, the students or the lecturer and the students that are seated in front of the professor. Things started to change in the Renaissance period when, as it is called from historians, also the period of princes and, let's say, patrons, when actually the professor would also gain a more hierarchical position. This image might be suggest that there is a certain, let's say, distance between students, but also in the same way, in the way that they are dressed. I think that an interesting book to understand what happened is also this uh, interesting and very beautiful text, actually, I would say, by Baldassare Castiglione, uh, of the Cortegiano, the courtier. The courtier was actually this figure that lived within the palazzo, the Italian palazzo, and was uh, teached uh, and uh, kind of uh, might be an artist, an architect, so painter, an intellectual. They would live within the court of the patron, under the patron, and would try to follow a certain kind of habits and behaviors. And by reading this book, it's also interesting that you understand that all of our rituals somehow today of courtesy, of being kind and so on, are coming from this tradition. And of course, this has to be implemented also in the architecture or had for sure an, an influence in the architecture of colleges. It's not by chance that this passage would be reflected here, where we see how the architecture of the college has come to the architecture of the palazzo. This short parenthesis of Renaissance uh, would also introduce some typological innovations, which are, and I would mention them very briefly, first of all, in this very interesting example that is the proposal both of Giuliano da Sangallo and Francesco di Giorgio for the Sapienza of Siena. So we are more or less within Renaissance period. And what happens here that especially in the proposal of Giuliano da Sangallo, we have the introduction of the corridor, which might be seen as the first evidence of corridors in domestic architecture. And perhaps uh, uh, the use of walls uh, uh, besides the, the corridor, the use of walls, the use of also the association of corridors with the loggia, which is also an additional element, would warranty a certain, let's say, separation, separation between teaching activities and dwellings. Also in terms of, let's say, of privacy, this becomes a quite intelligent innovation. And another important innovation is, uh, in compared to, to Middle Ages, is the introduction of individual rooms. This would allow students, let's say, deans and rectors to have even a more a better control over students' life, because basically having them in cellular, let's say, situation would kind of implement also better, the, uh, or would allow or facilitate the implementation of internal rules even better within the college. And another important change is, of course, that the students, especially the Sapienza, which is something that is quite not well debated in general, is that from the time uh, in accessing student colleges, we'll also ask them a certain a fee. So in order to, to enter the palazzo, you have actually to pay. Well, as I said, this was not the case in Middle Ages. In confront of Giuliano Sangallo, the example of Francesco Di Giorgio allows this uh, more clear, let's say, uh, understanding of this paradigm, as I said, with the palazzo. And this becomes even more explicit with the example of the, with the project launched by uh, uh, Pope Leo uh, X uh, in, let's say, uh, early uh, 16th century with the project of, let's say, concentrating or somehow translating the power of Florence in Rome and by selecting Piazza Navona as the center of, uh, let's say, power of Rome. Besides, let's say, building the palazzo of the Medici family, Leo, uh, Leo X actually was one of the components of the Medici who became pope at the time. Besides be, building the palazzo right in front of Piazza Navona, it's quite interesting that the Sapienza of Rome which is still there, uh, had to be built very close to the palazzo and was still integrated in this uh, general project uh, of, let's say, exclusivity that was becoming part characteristic of the college of this time. Of course, uh, in the context of history of education, the appearance of the Company of Jesus uh, uh, in uh, 1540 had to be understood as a critique to the exclusivity of the palazzo to a certain extent. Jesuits uh, initially would start from the lost tradition of uh, the college as a caritative mission by accepting pure students to add up at the end of the 18th century to a more elitistic tradition of knowledge uh, with the tradition of student as a humanist uh, as, and scientist. Uh, 
At the very beginning, uh, right after the foundation, the order of the Jesuits was soon understood, especially even by many historians understand them today as a teaching order, because they dedicated their primary mission to education worldwide. Officialized as a counter-reformation order, their plan was facilitated by the intention of Rome to fight the spread of Christianity. And this was kind of, uh, was kind of be planned in two ways. On the one hand, as it is shown in the image of the left, depicting a picture of uh, Ignazio and Rome. By the way, Ignazio La Loyola was basically, of, uh, from Loyola was basically the founder of the Jesuit order. And in, in, uh, in this depiction of Rome at the time, we see here the presence of, uh, let's say, uh, one policy, which is the invitation of students in Rome that would join the seminars and the colleges of Jesuits in Rome, and then will go back to their countries and try to, to spread uh, Christian, uh, Christianity in this way. The other way around was actually to build colleges in these territories where basically the Protestant, let's say, threat was quite heavy and important, especially in Germany, but particularly also in France. In terms of education, the Jesuit uh, referred to these documents. The first is the most important work that the Jesuit was uh, the book of Ignatius of Loyola who, and his spiritual exercise, consisting of a series of practices which are mainly based on repetition and a rigid time schedule. Of course, this would require a, uh, another seminar, but I'm simplifying. And these, uh, let's say, exercises that be became part soon of the pedagogical program of the order in their seminal work through the Ratio Studiorum. Ratio Studiorum is actually the document through which all the Jesuits had to sign and to read and also to, it was like a shared Google Drive doc, let's say, in another way. But everybody has to write his own interpretation for the rules of the organization of colleges, and this became the main document that regulated uh, all uh, the, the social life within colleges, but especially the uh, pedagogical program. Uh, one of the most paradigmatic examples of this tradition, uh, first of all, the, is, is the college, college Romano built in Rome in 1584 and designed partially by an architect called Giuseppe Valeriano, if, if I'm not wrong, was a Jesuit himself. First of all, uh, the Jesuit will refer to the type of the sapienza for their project, of the palazzo, in other words, and even if you visit this building, it's quite interesting because you feel like you are within a palazzo. And uh, another innovation is that the Jesuit introduced their uh, pedagogical program, the subdivision of schools and classes. This maybe was the most important thing. This is why also in this example, but there are even more explicit examples of this passage, we can see that there is a separation between what is called the, the school, the real school, and in fact, there is an, let's say, open access also to the public, to the, to, the, to the square and to the rest of the city, because of the fact that this college had to be frequented not only from the students of the college itself, but also from the rest of the city. And what I said uh, is interesting to know that there is this appearance of the modern classroom to a certain extent. So the way the, uh, the, the structural rule of the Jesuit was uh, written, it allowed somehow the invention of the modern classroom with classrooms and corridors. And there is still the persistence of corridors coming somehow from the uh, tradition of Giuliano da San Gallo before, where the corridor will still uh, the corridor will still remain for separating rooms between each other. Uh, then, of course, between these two very long or historical moments, the one of the Jesuits and the invention of the campus. Uh, it is, of course, a very long period of time that I'm summarizing here. There are a series of other important elements that would happen at the time, especially with the, let's say, the closure of uh, the Jesuit order in the late, in the early uh, 18th century in France and in Italy as well. But in this time, I would say that uh, a, a new important paradigm that could, would kind of question also the tradition of colleges and courtyard buildings as a consequence is the work of an education related to the building of uh, campuses in the United States uh, uh, as a new, let's say, state institution. Here, the figure, the figure of the student as a knowledge worker, as a knowledge worker, I'm using this term, which is an anticipation of a very contemporary condition, which is more ours, let's say, is actually related to the production of the student as part of the middle class. So the invention of the United States, to a certain extent, corresponds also to the project of the United States 
for creating a, a new middle class uh, from scratch somehow. And this, and in this, let's say, passage, the college or the campus has a very fundamental role. The project of the Virginia campus designed by Thomas Jefferson coincides as well with the, a certain pastoral turn where the campus as a type, uh, it becomes the main protagonist. And this is reflected, I would say, in two ways. The first is that in the 18th and 19th century, the concept of college uh, in general, or the idea of going to college for a student had a very low reputation. For a series of different reasons, even parents started, especially bourgeois, bourgeois families, they started to avoid this idea of sending their students to colleges, especially because colleges were considered for a series of reasons related to military, let's say, organization of life, to hospitals, to to, to archetypes that still had a very, uh, let's say, stigma. So in this sense, uh, Jefferson, let's say, uh, experience refers as, as well to this, let's say, tradition that is played by the work of Pestalozzi or uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau with his treatise on Emile, when all these, let's say, guys were trying to give a new understanding of education, when education for them was uh, an exclusivity of parents. So for them, especially for Rousseau, uh, and Pestalozzi, of course, the uh, the idea that children had to be only educated only through their family, uh, through their families, uh, and from their parents. Jefferson, who knew well this tradition because he was in the in Europe at the time when these let's say discussions in general education was going on, he tried somehow, or at least this is my interpretation, to uh, kind of translate this also in the organization of the of the campus. The Virginia campus, uh, besides being a giant project uh, of a system of, of an enclosure, had to be seen, first of all, in its fragmentary, let's say, components. Uh, I would like to, to say, first of all, that the idea Jefferson didn't invent the campus. The campus invented with, uh, was invented with, uh, with the rival of, uh, let's say, Puritans uh, and uh, European colleges in uh, let's say in the north of Uni of America when and in fact the the word campus appears at the first time at Princeton in 1771 and it referred actually to a very small plot of land of agricultural land but this will become systematic only through the work not only of Jefferson but especially his contemporaries where education in order to, to be governed first of all had to be secularized so there is this let's say negation of what was the previous tradition of religious uh, colleges and organization of life and secondly it is important to allow let's say families to bring their children to to college also to make this more familiar look like no to a certain extent what uh, let's say loco parentis was an expression that was used in order to make the children or to, these kids feel as they were at home within colleges so uh, this, let's say, organization of, uh, of the campus was, was uh, reflected uh, in a very clear way, especially in the way Jefferson was organizing uh, his interpretation of Palladio, of course, of the villa as a component to create the campus. And in fact, uh, this idea of the family-like situation was reflected in the way that the professor had to live in his own pavilion, which was basically a Palladian villa. Uh, and the students had to be adjacent to it, uh, leaving each on one single cell. According to Jefferson and to many experiences of other examples of colleges at the time, uh, this was the way somehow to secularize this passage of education in the way that professors were kind of uh, um, advised to manage their class and to consider their students as part of their own family. So the student, the professor had to be considered the father and the student his children. This somehow actually characterizes, uh, especially this period, which I think is quite interesting in terms of, let's say, not only organization of the college, but of the entire campus. Because if we see this image, uh, also the use, uh, the use of uh, vegetalization, of green, of greenery, trees and parks and so on, this idyllic condition of the, of the campus, which be, will be very helpful to create this gradual passage as I would argue in my research. Then, uh, concluding, uh, I would like to say how, actually, uh, very briefly, this uh, uh, passage of the campus from USA to Europe was somehow refused to the student, uh, from the students. 
And uh, first of all, I would like to show uh, that there is a very interesting typological change from the fir first examples of the very, let's say, uh, solid structure and to its gradual, let's say, secularization, which in other words corresponds to a sort of not only fragmentation in terms of architectural uh, composition, but first of all in terms of dissolution. This becomes quite clear in the way the American model was transferred in Europe uh, during the 60s. Uh, it was confronted with hostility with the students. Mm -hmm. May 68 in Paris, for example, was fueled by the students coming from the campus of Nanterre and joining the center of Paris. And something happened, of course, in cities also close to us, like Zurich, as well as here in Lausanne. The decision of the city to externalize uh, students was not well accepted, actually, from them. But, of course, uh, the model that we imported was not one, the one designed by Jefferson. It was more a neoliberal version where one of the basic needs, housing, has been basically excluded from campus planners. Issues like circulation and flexibility and logistics became the main, let's say, elements for organizing campus life. However, the campus is an integrated part, of course, of our uh, way knowledge is being produced today. And at the same time, the ideolo its ideology of vegetalization continues to hide the other ideology, that of the student as entrepreneur and or the student as a worker. I would like to conclude uh, with a quote uh, which was published in a pamphlet in 1966 uh, by the Situationist International Students of the University of Strasbourg uh, before the events of May 68. Uh, this was published actually in parallel with the typology of the campus when it was gradually being transferred in Europe. So this passage uh, that I would like to read, nowadays the teenager shuffles, shuffles off the moral prejudice and the authority of the family to become part of the market even more, even before he's an adolescent. At 15 he's all at the delights of being directly exploited. Adolescence and its crisis may bring occasionally brushes with his family, but in essence, he is not troublesome. He agrees to be treated as a baby by the institutions which provide his education. If ever they stop screwing his eyes off, it's only to come around and kick him in the balls. So this passage, on the one hand, is the exposure of uh, only one side, of course, of the whole history of education and uh, of universities since the Middle Ages, till today, which is actually this side of pro proletarization of knowledge. But of course, on the other side, it still reminds us, uh, sorry, I lost the mouse. Okay. Okay, sorry. So I was saying that uh, on the other side, this condition uh, reminds us uh, of the precariousness that still affects students, researchers, and grad workers, us, basically. However, if we look at the terrible hell of the labor, mar of the labor market, places like colleges, classrooms, and campuses are still places where we could still some find some forms of solidarity, respect, and of course, of being together. So, thank you. Uh, thank you, Marson, for this uh, presentation. And uh, in a way, um, I think your your lecture shows very well this uh, ambivalence of, of types as uh, both forms of constraint, but also enablers of of new relationships. And uh, I, uh, you know, I wonder how the you know type uh, in in this case is useful. To, um, uh, to really talk about university in general, no? because it seems to me that uh, in, in what you showed there is a great degree of planning. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and maybe I want you to elaborate really on this uh, uh, relationship between institutions uh, and, and their capacity to plan, you know? to, to organize, basically, and how type really plays a role in that relationship. Yes, it's true, uh, and in fact, planning in universities becomes quite important in the in the 60s. Uh, and uh, in terms of architecture, this planning, let's say, when 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 planning will prevail on the invention of type, 
uh, this will uh, kind of create a certain distance between the production of types and architecture within the campus. Uh, uh, and I'm, in order to clarify this, I refer to the fact that at a certain point, campus, especially in the 60s, was understood also as a real estate, let's say, uh, yeah. land. Uh, you know? So in order to, to produce this, uh, uh, the production of architecture was, uh, in the campus was understood more as a way to increase the value of the campus and, of course, to generate not only students but also investors. Uh, and this was done uh, with a very, let's say, simple way by inviting, especially in the 60s, famous architects to produce landmarks and important buildings in order to, uh, let's say, allow this. So, on the one hand, there is a production of types in this way, I would say. On the other hand, there is a lot of uh, planning uh, through policies and logistics, particularly, yeah. or at least is what I think. Yes, Davide. Uh, Davide, wait the microphone. Well, <clears throat> I have a question. I mean, first of all, thanks. Very beautiful presentation and somehow very dear to some of my studies. Uh, so we have to speak more, I think. Um, I had a question about, I mean, you, you clarified really in a very precise way the relationship between the, the let's say, typological transformation of the campus and the, the transformation of the subjectivity that the campus addresses. This is incredibly clear and, of course, pro much more complex, but let's say that it's, it's a really um, powerful. Uh, but I was wondering, uh, what are your thoughts about the relationship between the campus and the city? Meaning, you talked about the kind of disintegration, but perhaps we could see this dialectic, let's say, between the campus being, of course, something that it's, to a certain extent, by definition, separated from the outside. But this separation, um, I'm not sure if we can see an evolution just in one direction, but maybe perhaps a different moments of influence, reciprocal influence. For example, I guess um, in the case of the Jesuits, uh, Ignazio really chose to be in the center of the city as a kind of specific choice, strategic choice, let's say, and of course uh, in this idea of evangelization. So I, I was wondering what do you think about that and um, one thought that came to my mind is whether it would be interesting a little incursion on the math building, for example, Fry University, which in which I think this relationship with eventually an ideal city mm -hmm. is kind of, um, um, I think, explicit somehow. Yeah, I will try to answer very briefly, I guess, because, uh, um, yeah, it's a very interesting question and it's also very important because I'm still concerned with its relationship and, in fact, it's interesting to note, first of all, with the example of uh, Jefferson, the, or the American tradition, uh, there is this, of course, political attempt to kind of uh, respond to uh, or to challenge the city uh, in a way that the campus was also part of this agenda of Jefferson of the anti-city somehow. So uh, the academical village was also a kind of potential settlement. Mm -hmm. So, uh, on the one hand. On the other hand, the modern campus, especially what came in Europe uh, with this very consolidated presence of universities <coughs> in the cities, uh, uh, was, of course, uh, I would perhaps say still a real estate strategy somehow, or it seems to be a real estate strategy, especially in recent times, that uh, one particular key moment is the exclusion of housing from campus. So the campus has to rely on the city in terms, of course, of labor power, but also in terms of markets, not only real estate, but in general facilities and so on. So I think that there is a dialectic which is quite, I mean, the campus without the city could not be possible, I would say. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much. It was really a wonderful, wonderful presentation. And I particularly appreciated, obviously, the way in which you really see type as this evolutionary process in which, you know, the, there's also this really inter interesting dynamic where sometimes it's the changing subject that changes the architecture, and sometimes it's the change in architecture that drives the change of subject. But I was wondering about something in life, especially of Tiago's presentation yesterday, where he was putting forward this concept of typological transfer, 
uh, about the fact that at a certain point uh, uh, we can take the, the campus uh, minus the student, because I think what was beautiful in your presentation is, is that they went together, right? Mm -hmm. But now we can take the uh, student out of the equation and then typologically transfer the campus to uh, other to other environments where, in fact, actually you don't have students anymore. Yeah. For instance, you know, purely productive environments. And I was uh, wondering whether you thought about that in your in your uh, uh, research and how do you see this question of typological transfer in the specific case of the archetypes that you are yeah. and I'm using archetypes on purpose that you are addressing. <laughs> Yeah, it's quite an interesting question, and I uh, think that this becomes maybe clear with some very um, few, uh, very contemporary examples, uh, in a way. Of course, uh, I might answer that the tradition that the an offspring of the campus was, of course, all the examples of pastoral, let's say, uh, United States with office parks and all these things. Uh, which would rely, especially in the United States, this implies, for example, the mythology of Stanford and the garage of Steve Jobs somehow. Uh, without the presence of Stanford, something like that would have never been possible, and it was a moment when mm, the United States had pushed a lot of funding uh, for having these, let's say, campuses, and we produce later on, so the, uh, the suburban garage is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, what I see in general, especially with this idea of the vegetalization, which seems quite in fashion today, which is part of this idea of, uh, I don't know if I can use the word, like campusizing uh, the territory. So I see that, uh, especially in, in our, in where we live, I see this, let's say, even real estate, there are a lot of real estate, let's say, projects outside Luzan somehow, in a very campus-like uh, setting, you know. Uh, so to a certain extent now, campus seems to be especially facilitated with this ide ideology of, uh, Transition somehow, if I can still use a use to borrow from yesterday, uh, allows this, let's say, implementation of the campus as a, to the old territory. So. You could even imagine that, you know, also following the discussion, we're having that, you know, after the camp, now you have the campus, which yeah. is a slightly different, you know, idea of settlement that then you migrates from a very specific context. Uh, to you know a pattern of settlement that, that can be applied to the city in general. Now also goes back actually the Dalibor's question about the relationship with the city. Yeah, especially because I mean there is a problem with cities today, I mean in terms of density and so on. So it goes hand to hand, I think, with the uh, with the invention also sometimes of new settlements. I mean uh, yeah I think that uh, I um, think we have to I'm sorry I, I will play this uh, really a, a full, uh, a full uh, role of the guillotine, uh, but uh, now we have to move on. Uh, thank you, uh, Natsol. Um,